Good morning. We're in uh, chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, if you want to turn there. January uh, 7th, 2024. I won't ask you how you're doing with your resolutions. <laughs> Best resolution I think we could make would be to grow in the knowledge of his will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, the prayer of the uh, Apostle Paul in the Ephesians. You know, I don't know where this uh, idea came from. I think it had something uh, to do with my dad, but uh, the family seems to think when you're 80, you can say anything you want to and get away with it. But uh, I don't know if that's true. And uh, I just want to say that if I say anything contrary to scripture, uh, let, let me know, uh, you can fire me, okay? <laughs> So, looking at 1 Corinthians, so far in the first letter here, uh, the, the Apostle Paul's been addressing quite a number of issues, maybe a better word would be problems. In the church, they were divided over their teachers. There was the problem of sexual immorality. There were problems of lawsuits. Paul also, also dealt with the matter of eating food offered to idols. The Lord's Supper was another issue. And now in chapter 12, we come to the matter of spiritual gifts, which led to another problem, and that was the matter of pride. I think what the Corinthians needed is something that we probably all could use from time to time, and that's a good dose of humility. And I ventured to say there was a time when the Corinthians displayed that quality. How do I know that? Everyone needs to humble themselves before the Lord to receive God's saving grace and mercy. In fact, Paul, in the beginning of this letter, in chapter 1, verse 4, said this, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace that was given to you by Christ Jesus. The greatest gift is salvation. And like all the gifts, they had forgotten something very important, that we receive the gift of salvation and all the other gifts by his grace, not deserving them or having earned them. And Paul asked a very penetrating question in chapter 7. For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? And now if indeed you did receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? So let's take a moment to focus on the greatest gift, singular, before we look at some of the gifts, plural. I believe a proper understanding would have solved the pride problem for the Corinthians. When we trust Christ as Savior, we receive the spiritual gift of salvation. And we can't have salvation without forgiveness. At the point of salvation, we also receive justification, redemption, reconciliation, propitiation, regeneration. And uh, I don't want to uh, get into uh, a long dissertation or spend a lot of time on definitions this morning, but just enough to remind us who we are and what we have in Christ. Justification means to be declared righteous. Redemption means Jesus Christ, by means of his sacrificial death, purchased believers from the slavery of sin to set us free from bondage, from the law. The law demands perfection. Grace makes us perfect. Reconciliation means God restores man to a favorable relationship with himself by means of the cross. Propitiation means satisfaction. <clears throat> the death of Christ fully satisfied the demands of a 
righteous God. And now the believer is free from judgment. Regeneration means God makes the believer spiritually alive as a result of trusting Christ for salvation. Can there be any doubt that salvation is the greatest gift? Now chapter 12 begins with the words, now concerning. Apparently Paul is responding to another question from the Corinthian church. When was the last time you wrote a letter? I used to write quite a few when I was separated from Carol in the army and I believe you'd call them love letters and they were meant only for her. And that's not the case with this letter to the Corinthians. It's for the entire Corinthian church. And uh, there are some things when we read Paul's letters that he doesn't want us to be ignorant, ignorant about. Don't be ignorant of God's plan for Israel in Romans 11.25. Israel has been set aside, but it's only temporary until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, until the rapture. In 1 Thessalonians 4.13, Paul says this, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not even as others that have no hope. The dead in Christ will rise first, and then those that are alive will be caught up to be with him in the air. That's the rapture. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul warns against being taken advantage of by Satan, for we're not ignorant of his devices or schemes. And now when we come to 1 Corinthians 12, 1, Paul says, I would not have you ignorant about spiritual gifts. That's an interesting statement concerning the fact that the spiritual gifts were very prominent. They were much in evidence among them. In chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, Paul said the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you. And then verse 7 says, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Despite that, the church was a mess. So when Paul says, don't be ignorant about spiritual gifts, I believe Paul is leading up to the fact that one can have gifts of the Holy Spirit and still be immature. Paul is beginning to make the case that every Christian is spiritual when we trust Christ for salvation. In 1 Corinthians 12 verse 2, Paul refers to the time when the Corinthians were being led by dumb idols. <clears throat> Today, Satan is still in the business of leading people away from the one true God by means of false religion. Satan can look like an angel of light, 2 Corinthians 11 14. And his ministers can appear as ministers of righteousness. 2 Corinthians 11, 15. Going on in verse 3, Paul gives a guideline in order to determine the source of spiritual gifts. Does it glorify the Lord Jesus Christ or a false one? If someone is truly spiritual, that person will not speak evil of Jesus Christ. One of the things Paul will be dealing with is speaking in tongues. We can actually find evidence of that in the Old Testament. And it was not happening in a good way. According to Isaiah 8, verse 19, when they say to you, consult the mediums and wizards who whisper and mutter, should not a people consult their God? And that's a good indication of what Paul is warning the Corinthians about. If a man says Jesus is accursed, you can be sure he is demon-inspired. Even in the Old Testament, they have their prayer language that God had nothing to do with. Of course, we find a legitimate use of tongues at Pentecost, 
in Acts chapter 2. But this is the background out of which the Corinthians came from. Now Paul goes on in verse 3 saying no one has the ability to confess that Jesus is Lord apart from the Holy Spirit. The unsaved person will not recognize that Jesus is Lord. What a person says about Jesus Christ indicates whether or not he speaks from the Holy Spirit. In verse 4, Paul is saying there are many different gifts and the Holy Spirit is the source of all of them. The word gift is a Greek word, charis, charisma. Charis means grace. There are grace gifts. Christians and non-Christians are talented in many ways, but only Christians have spiritual gifts. Diversities in verse 4 means there are different kinds of gifts for different people. Paul goes on in verse 5 saying there are different administrations. Another word for administrations would be ministries. Therefore, we can see that the purpose of the gifts are in the area of service. There are diversities of activities or operations according to verse 6. And it's the same God who works all the gifts. And as it says in verse 6, who worketh all in all. God works all the gifts in all believers. <laughs> In verse 7, we find out the reason for the gifts, to profit with all, or we could say to benefit all. Some translations say for the common good. It brings to mind Acts 20, verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. That's the foundation in order to share the gift that God has given to benefit others. And now as we come to verses 8 to 10, we have to take in, uh, into consideration that the sign gifts have ceased. In the first six Pauline letters written during the Acts period, the sign gifts were operating in the churches. Galatians, the two Thessalonian letters, the two Corinthian letters, and Romans. In these letters we find tongues, we find the gift of prophecy, the gift of healing. When we come to 1 Corinthians 13, the Lord revealed to Paul that the sign gifts were going to cease. With the close of the book of Acts, the Lord completed the revelation of the mystery. In the letters written after the book of Acts, we find the word epignosis, the full knowledge. The sign gifts would end when that which is perfect has come. We'll talk more about that when we get to chapter 13. When the completed word of God is come. In the letters written after the end of Acts, there is no mention about tongues or healing and so on. Those letters are Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Philippians, in the three pastoral epistles, 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus. There's a lot more that could be said about all this, but it should help us as we come to verse 8. In verse 8, Paul mentions the word of wisdom. Ernie Campbell points out in his commentary that the word wisdom is used eight times by Paul in reference to the wisdom of God, 16 times regarding the truth specifically revealed to the church. And next, Paul mentions the gift of faith in verse 9. There is faith and there is the gift of faith. Faith as it relates to salvation and there was for that time period to perform miracles. Even Paul had that gift during the transition period. <coughs> Excuse me. In Acts 19, verse 11, it says God brought special miracles by the hands of Paul. And Paul goes on in verse 9 
in our text this morning, chapter 12, verse 9, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Paul had that gift during the Acts period. After Acts 28, the gift of healing ceased to operate. His friend Epaphroditus was near death in Philippians 2.27, but Paul could not heal him. It was God that intervened. When Timothy was sick in 1 Timothy 5, verse 23, Paul did not heal him, but told him to drink a little wine for his stomach's sake. Paul left Trophimus sick at Miletus, 2 Timothy 4, verse 20. God does heal today sometimes, but there are no divine healers. Today, we can claim the same promise given to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. The working of miracles are mentioned in verse 10. And once again, he's referring to sign gifts. Remember in chapter 1, the Jews require a sign. The Lord told the apostles to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils in Matthew 10, 8. In Mark 16, he told them to speak with new tongues, take up serpents, drink poison, and lay hands on the sick. However, when Israel's program ended, these miracles faded, and at the close of Paul's ministry, they were gone. Next, Paul mentions prophecy in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10. Is the gift of prophecy still active today? It depends on how you define prophecy. If it's defined as receiving direct revelation from God outside of the Bible, the answer is no. If, on the other hand, it's defined as repeating what has already been revealed, then the answer is yes. One is foretelling, and the other is forthtelling. What's happening today is forthtelling. Verse 10 also mentions the, the discerning of spirits. The gospel of grace was not in written form as we always have it today. That gift was necessary to know if someone was speaking the truth by means of the Holy Spirit. The next thing Paul mentions is diverse kinds of tongues. That could be translated various languages. The ability to speak a foreign language, language without having learned it. Verse 10 goes on to another was given the interpretation of tongues. Corinth was a multilingual city, so therefore there was a need to interpret for the benefit of those present. In verse 11, Paul said the source of all the gifts was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit distributed to each one individually according to the sovereign will of God. In verse 12, Paul compares the physical body to the spiritual body of Christ. The body is one, yet has many members. The body of Christ is made up of many members which make up one single unit. And in verse 12 it says, so also is Christ. All believers are members of Christ. That's reinforced for us in Galatians 3.28. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul goes on in verse 13 to explain how we, how we become members of the body of Christ. By one spirit are we all baptized into one body. The Holy Spirit is the agent that places believers into the body of Christ. This is a spirit baptism, not water. We can translate the word baptized as to identify. The Holy Spirit identifies us with the body of Christ at salvation. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, according to verse 13, the Holy Spirit places everyone in the body of Christ on the basis of their faith in Jesus Christ 
and the finished work of the cross. Whether bond or free, all have been made to drink into that one spirit. The baptism of the spirit is not an experience. We're identified with the body of Christ at the moment of salvation. The spirit baptism described here is not the same as what took place at Pentecost in the book of Acts. In Acts, the baptizer is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 tells us it's the Holy Spirit that baptizes us into the body of Christ. And the reason for the baptisms is also different. The baptisms here in Corinthians are associated with salvation. I should say the baptism is associated with salvation. The one at Pentecost was a matter of power for the ministry. The baptism in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 is the one baptism required for today. And according to Ephesians 4, 5, Paul states, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And next time we're going to see that every believer contributes to the total body. Each member is significant and important to the body. And it's made possible by the greatest gift, the gift of salvation. Now you may believe that it was a God-given faith or your own faith that brought you to salvation. Is it possible that it could be one or the other? Is it possible that both doctrines are true? There's a question that is sometimes used as a tool for witnessing to someone. If you were to die tonight and the Lord said to you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you tell him? Of course, that has to be answered before you die, doesn't it? But it's a good way to get a person's attention. But what if the question was, how were you saved? I believe the Bible teaches election and free will. I like to put it like this. Does God choose man or does man choose God? And rather to then go into a long explanation or dissertation, I'd like to have you consider one verse that I think explains both concepts. Both doctrines are found in one verse. John chapter 6, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. The first half of that verse speaks of God's sovereign choice. The last half extends the offer to all. And it's hard to wrap our finite minds around that, isn't it? Somebody said we're like sand pebbles in comparison to the greatness of God, almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, and all that therein is. How can God choose some and at the same time offer salvation freely to everyone. I don't understand that. But I believe it's true. How about you? I believe the thing to do is let God be God. Let's bow for prayer. Thank you, Father, for this time in your word. Thank you, Father, that you have saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works, but because of your purpose and grace. We are truly blessed. And thank you for that greatest gift of salvation. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.